TGIF, right? <laughs> um, thank you so much, guys, and Flynn and Gabby, for having me. It's very exciting. Um, Creative Mornings is a huge event and a global event, um, and I feel very honoured um, and very warm and very fuzzy to have been asked to um, be here today. Can everyone hear me? I'm kind of, okay, yes, nodding, cool. <laughs> Um, and I'm, I love a chat, but I'm kind of nervous, so just let's just go with it. We can pretend we're like in a rooftop bar having a very early morning drink or something, very casually. Um, okay, so first things first, death to neutrals. I try and live my life by this motto. And um, so I think the worst colour and the worst word, basically, in the whole world is puce. <laughs> Like, why would anyone let that ever be a thing? It just sounds gross, it looks gross, there's nothing good about it. So one of my heroes and fellow colour lover, Laurie Rosenwald, describes colours like puce as mutant bastard yucky colours of the apocalypse. And I actually couldn't really agree more with that. Um, give me the shameless simplicity of red, blue and yellow any day. Um, if it's good enough for the Queen, it's good enough for me. <laughs> So colour is a universal language. Um, it makes us feel things, it communicates, and it can even give us physical reactions. Basically, I just want my world, my life, my outfits, my face, my food, everything to be as colourful as possible at all times. Um, okay, so some of my favourite things in the whole world. Number one, old lady hair. <laughs> Why is purple hair a thing? I don't really get it. I mean. I read on the internet, so I guess it must be true, that um, <laughs> when you age, you, you're, you become less sensitive to the colour blue. And I'm not sure if that's true at all, but I guess it could make sense. Um, I remember that my next door neighbour, when I was about six, had fluoro purple hair, and I thought it was just the most divine thing I'd ever seen, basically. Number two, road rainbows. Okay, so I know this is really bad for like penguins and the environment and the world, but this shit is really beautiful sometimes. After it's been raining and you see this on the road, like, I feel like it's quite, yeah, stunning sometimes. But, you know, obviously bad for the environment. Number three, OCD colour wearers. I am aiming for this in my older years. I feel like any time you see anyone who has put this much effort into colourising their day, you really need to go up to them on the street and thank them. I try, I don't see this often enough, I think, out in the wild, but I feel like it's something we can all strive for, especially in our senior years, like, it's so divine. I feel like the world would be a better place if more people dressed like that. Number four, nature. Okay, like, what the hell is going on here? Can this, I just don't understand how such pure, beautiful colours can exist in the wild. I mean, it's just stunning. And these are all perfect examples of um, just completely complementary, beautiful um, colour harmony. Like, what the hell? Okay, number five, neon. So I actually get completely off on seeing a bloody good neon sign. I think I call it um, an eyegasm. So it's like <laughs> the colour and the light is so pure and so bright, it just kind of gets right into your eyes and it just gives me like a physical feeling that I really like. And lastly, number six, the Muppets. <laughs> or basically anything that Jim Henson has ever touched. I feel like the Muppets are so special and colour is so um, important in defining each of the different characters. Um, and obviously they had a big impact. This is one of my early works from 1990. Um, <laughs> and obviously the Muppets had a big impact on my illustration career, which started very early, obviously. So colour has formed um, a big part of my world for as long as I can remember, really. Um, as Gabby mentioned, I grew up in Broken Hill, which is kind of far west New South Wales. And colour, it kind of dictates a lot of um, life there. So, have you ever heard the saying, um, red sky in the morning is a shepherd's warning, red sky at night is a shepherd's delight. So, I mean, I've never really met a shepherd in real life, but, um, <laughs> but 
basically it means like if it's red sky in the morning, it's going to be really hot. And it's always, always true. So um, nature has ways of telling us things using colour. So yeah, basically it's just this really clashy wonderland of blue sky and red earth and um, not much else really. Okay, so both of my folks were kind of creative people, or well, very creative people. And even, uh, even as a kid, I was very, very colour conscious, as you can see. This is on my second birthday when I was given a pair of rainbow gumboots and a big bird raincoat. And I don't think I took those gumboots off for about a week. I even wore them to bed. So I can't wait to kind of have my own kids and they can do little maniac things like that. Um, and obviously, I'm not afraid of clashing patterns either or colours, which is always good. Um, for some reason, my mum always dressed my sister and I in identical outfits, even though we were two years apart. It was kind of creepy. Um, uh, maybe she just secretly wanted twins or something. I'm not sure. Um, and so I also have this theory that um, the artwork and imagery and the colours that surround us when we were a kid become very powerful. And the artwork that I kind of grew up with is so in embedded so deeply in my psyche and it affects my work in lots of ways. So this is two artworks that my parents had. Obviously, it's not the original, it's Picasso, but a print. Um, and these are two artworks that were in my house um, when I was young, and they've really um, impacted. And I feel like those colours and those kind of things really just, um, yeah, soaked into my psyche, really. And of course, I loved TV when I was a kid. Does anyone else remember Mully Grubs? Yes. So creepy. Can you imagine trying to get that concept <laughs> across today? So it's a creepy face with no body on a colour. Like, it's amazing. Um, and also Art Attack, Neil. Is it Neil from Art Attack? Um, my brain melted every time I watched this show when I was a kid. I love it so much. So I just feel like all of these things kind of combine to make me who I am today and kind of informed my love of colour today. So I'm kind of a bit ahead of myself, but um, yeah, for those of you who don't know me, I'm an illustrator and designer, formerly from here in Sydney, and now I'm in Melbourne as of only about eight weeks ago. Um, and this is some of my work recently. Um, so, yeah, you can see that colour informs a lot of what I do. Um, and I love using colour in different ways, basically. This is just a quick kind of snapshot of some work. And, yeah, it's obviously clear that, um, yeah, I use a lot of colour. I don't know, sometimes I think I use colour too much, in a way. Like, I, I want to challenge myself and try and do something with a really basic palette or do something in black and white or but then I just get bored and chuck it out so <laughs> <laughs> this is just a bit more work installation and I mean I don't know I suppose I said deaf to neutrals and whatever before but there is a time and a place for all colors I think um, sometimes you know colors behave really differently when you place them next to other colors and um, yeah, I don't know. Sometimes you need a place for your eye to rest and, you know, get a bit of breathing space. Something I'm working on, obviously. I like cramming as many colours as possible into everything. Yeah, so um, I'm kind of an obsessive person all around, really. So if I love a song, I'll listen to it on repeat um, until it makes me feel sick. Or if I get a favourite new lunch food, I'll eat it, eat it for 47 days in a row and not be able to look at it ever again. I'm kind of the same way about colour. So I will find, tap into a new colour somewhere and I'll become obsessed with using it. So for weeks and weeks, that's all I'll use. Um, and one of the very best things I think about colour is that inspiration for it is literally everywhere. So these are some of my favourite new colours that I've kind of stumbled across lately. Cooked broccoli, only cooked, not raw. The colour becomes completely different and so much more divine once it's cooked. Or steamed, even better. Valium, blue. <laughs> just a step up from duck eggs blue and just a little bit more buzzy and vibrant. Um, Valentino's tan. <laughs> um, I don't know what that's about really. Um, Anne Hathaway's there just for like comparative purposes. Overripe banana, probably about the day eight or nine level. Gumby, goes without saying, one of the best colours of all time. And my all-time favourites, seagull leg. Um, <laughs> check out their legs next time you see one. They're really bright and really... But again, they're mainly bright because they're contrasted against this lovely grey and pastel, so maybe death to some neutrals. <laughs> 
Okay, so um, I used to think, and sometimes I still think, that choosing colour names would be one of the best jobs in the whole world. You know, like on paint tins and nail polish and all that kind of crap. Um, and I feel like the people that pioneered the fanciful colour name are definitely Crayola. Anyone who has had a Crayola box over in their time will attest to this. So some of my favourite ever crayon names are Fuzzy Wuzzy, Inchworm, Macaroni and Cheese for obvious reasons, Razzle Dazzle Rose. I just feel like they're so good and their names are so evocative and so lovely. And fun fact alert, so Crayola have had to retire 13 colours from their repertoire um, since 1903. Um, in 1958, Prussian Blue was renamed Midnight Blue due, due to some ca casual um, connotations with the Holocaust, which is not so great. Um, and in 1962, um, they had to rename it Peach because of the US Civil Rights Movement. And obviously not everyone's skin colour is peach, and that's completely okay, Crayola, you know, they've realised. <laughs> Oh, okay, so um, there's been like quite a lot of research around this and it's been shown that products with fancy colour names actually sell more and people are more inclined to want an item if it's named like mocha instead of brown, even though it's exactly the same colour. Um, and these names get way weirder in the cosmetics realm. Um, companies are always trying to set themselves apart and distinguish their brands by using outlandish colour names. Um, and names that have connotations, even if they're kind of negative. So, I kid you not, these are real colours that exist, real nail polish colours that exist in the world. Okay, mildew. This is all real. Jizz. <laughs> Do you like my new nails? It's jizz. <laughs> Two weeks sober. And butt taco. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> What does that mean? <laughs> we probably don't want to know, actually. Um, and fun fact alert number two. So I thought fancy colour names would be like a kind of new um, like marketing thing. But apparently the, it's been around forever. I found this amazing resource when I was researching for this called the like fashion colour database or something. And it charted almost every colour from 600 AD until 1939. And... Um, some corkers that I found were goose turd from 1580, <laughs> dying monkey from 1590, and dead Spaniard from 1620. So you've got to love those Elizabethans, very creative and very uncouth. So colour is also a very powerful thing when it comes to our food. Humans are kind of intrinsically um, programmed to avoid black, blue, purple foods because they occur so rarely in nature. And normally we kind of associate them with things that have gone bad or mould and mildew and, you know, things that basically will kill us. So if you've ever worked in an office when there's been a bag of jelly beans around, you can probably attest to this. Um, so actually, who eats the black jelly beans? Anyone? Oh, not many. See? Okay, don't talk to those guys later. That's just... <laughs> that's really gross. So. <laughs> Um, so I've realised, um, even though many of us don't like black jelly beans, and that's fine, um, so many of these colour associations with food are cultural, so, especially with branded food. So I lived in London for about two years, and the first time I tried to buy a bag of crisps, my whole world was turned upside down. Okay, green for salt and vinegar, that is not a thing. Everyone knows that salt and vinegar is red, purple, that colour. And blue for cheese and unmistakably cheese and unmistakably original. That's what blue is, not cheese and onion. Oh, okay. So I had failed to realise. <laughs> <laughs> That's my next section. Um, so, yeah, I'd failed to realise that um, chip packets aren't universal, which is a sad thing. And also, it's just been indoctrinated because we live in Australia and that's what we grew up with, that we think chicken is green. Like, why would chicken be green? Okay, and so even though seeing colour is one of the most basic things that our brain does, okay, let's just brace ourselves. Colour isn't really real. It's all just white light bouncing off stuff. Just think about that for a second. 
there is no colour in the world. It's mind-blowing. So obviously a lot of you know this, but um, when our eyes see colour, all our brain is doing is interpreting white light. So no objects are intrinsically you know, yellow or red or whatever. It's all just light. And I find that very scary. <laughs> our good friend um, Isaac Newton even went to great lengths to um, establish this, in, including um, poking himself in the eye with a knife a few times, just to kind of see what would happen back there. Um, and of course, he is the one that realised that, yeah, colour isn't inherent in any objects, which I find terrifying. So it's just surfaces of objects. You know, some surfaces reflect some colours and um, absorb other colours, and we only see the colours that are reflected. So next time your client says, but I hate green, you can say, well, green doesn't even exist. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I believe that colour makes us feel things. Um, I use colour to communicate, um, and I send messages through my work using colour. Um, and I feel like it's important and it makes us feel good. Um, you know, I get a lot of people that say, your work is so vibrant, you know, it makes me feel happy when I look at it, and, you know, I feel like that's the power of colour, and for me that's kind of what it's all about, if I can make people feel good and make myself feel good and have fun, and colour's a really big part of that. Um, so, yeah, colour brings joy to my life, colour has power, and, um, yeah, I think we could all kind of use it a bit more. And also, don't ever forget, death to neutrals. That's all. <laughs>